Well, good morning, everybody. How are we all doing this morning? What's up? Hey, turn to the person next to you and say, you look good today. Turn to the other person and say, you could have done better. You could have done better. I, I got to be honest. I got to be. Hey, I am so excited to be with you all this morning. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Pastor Mylan. I am the next gen associate pastor here at C3 Church, aka the guy that runs around a lot and gets super energetic and loves Jesus. That's me. That's me. So if you're wondering, I'm that guy. And I, again, am so honored to be here with you this morning. And this morning, we're going to be talking about a topic that um, the enemy does not like. Uh, we're going to be talking about a topic that is seen as something that's outdated and overrated. And I am super excited to talk about this topic. But before we get into that, I just want to give three quick shout outs. Actually, we're going to add one for can we just give it up for Pastor Grant this morning? Come on. <laughs> Leading us in worship and stepping in. I feel like it was one of those worship sets where it took us until that fourth song to break through something. And sometimes that's what happens. That's what the enemy does. He tries to convince us that this isn't going anywhere, but we went somewhere. Praise God. And I'm just so thankful that we have a leader in our worship team that steps in and steps up. And, and in that... Uh, uh, the, the message I'll be speaking today was actually our Friday night, our gospel presentation message at Moment Conference, which was three weeks ago, which seems crazy to me. But it was, it was our invitation for students to receive um, Jesus. And I, I was supposed to preach today a, a different message, but the Holy Spirit was like, nah, you're going to preach this one. I'm like, okay, sounds good. I'm, I'm going to submit to you because you're better than me. So praise God. Uh, but I just want to give a shout out to everyone that helped with Moment Conference. And, and I know we've been highlighting that a lot, but I think you, I really want you, our whole congregation, to understand what God did in 36 hours. He changed people's lives. He changed student lives. I, I, to watch our students go all in. We talked all weekend about, hey, can you give 100%, 100%. And then the last night, I encouraged our students, now it's time to give that last 10%. And, and they did, and our leaders responded, and it was a very good time. But it didn't start, shout out number two, it all started, actually, with our leadership in this church. We had four elders in our church volunteering that whole weekend to pour into the next generation. And so I, I say that to say what Pastor Metz, Matt this morning said about the next generation, this church does take very seriously, as we should. And I, and, and I believe that our, our church is blessed with leaders. If you look at the Bible, there's a word that's said in Matthew, and it's, it's the word meek. Not weak, but meek. And, and in Matthew 5, it says, blessed are the meek. And if you look at that word at its full capacity, what it's saying is blessed or happy, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, happy as in pure joy, God-filled joy, are the people who have the power to do anything who have the capability to rock the world, but they're submitted to God and they're submitted to their brothers and sisters around them. And they harness that power for good. That's what meekness is. And we are blessed at this church with leaders who are meek, not weak, but meek. And I am so thankful that we get to serve in a church where our leaders have the power to do anything. They could manipulate, they could do all these things, but they're not. They pray for you. They, they cheer you on. They celebrate the wins with you guys, and they're meek, and they take that power, and they're submitted to God, and they use it for good. What a beautiful place to be a part of. And the last shout-out, and that all starts with our amazing pastors and Pastor Matt and Pastor Angel. Yes, they are my mom and dad. They are my mom and dad, but because they are my mom and dad, I've been able to see them live out what it means to be humble and meek at a very close capacity. And I can boldly and confidently say that our pastors are two of the most meek and humble people that you will ever meet. And they carry that out in their whole life. So let's just give it up one more time for our leadership at this church. So anyway, long introduction. I'm just like my dad. Um, anyway, uh, that's right. We got some laughs this morning. Everybody's awake. Let's go. So this morning, we're going to be talking about purity. Uh oh, now everybody's like, okay, the dude that's 24, he's engaged. By the way, my fiance is right here in the front row. That's right. <clears throat> God took his time on her. Amen. Oh, she is beautiful. Um, 
But I'm not going to, I know what you're thinking, like, oh, purity conversation. The boy's about to talk about relationships and marriage and sex and all those things. And I just want to say, no, I'm not. That is an aspect of purity. That is a very big aspect of purity. But I believe that the word of God paints a very much bigger and broader picture of what purity is supposed to look like, of what godly purity is supposed to look like. I believe that where purity is, there is power. That's the title of our message this morning. I just thought of it right now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Where there's purity, there is power. And my goal this morning is to tear down the lies of what the world claims about purity. If you look at social media, if you look at any ad on a billboard, if you look at the way that people treat each other, it would be quite hard to find someone that is full of purity. Or, in another way of saying it, has a pure heart. Um, the world is really good at making it seem like that purity is something that robs us or prevents us from having fun, freedom, or being our true selves. And I want to take time this morning to show you by the word of God that I believe that when we truly understand what it means to be pure in heart, it does not do anything with preventing, but it has everything to do with protecting. It has nothing to do with preventing, but everything to do with protecting. The word purity in the biblical definition literally means guiltless, blameless, or someone who has innocent and holy behavior. When it comes to the world's definition of purity and what they see it as, it is seen as something that is completely opposite of what God says it is. Some of you might be in this room and you're like, bro, where is he going with this? Like, does the Bible even talk that much about purity outside of maybe one or two verses? Y- yes, it does. Uh, if we look in Psalms, Psalms 19.9, it says, the fear of the Lord is what? Pure. Enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. What that is saying is the fear of the Lord is not that you're afraid of God. It's that you're afraid to not be close to God. And so the fear or the, the, the fear of that you're not going to be close to him, that in its like in its wholeness is pure. And then it goes on and Paul says in Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is what? Pure. Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think of these things. Paul is commanding us to think pure thoughts. He's commanding us to be pure in mind. He's commanding us to be pure in heart. This verse is one, the next one that, we, that, we, that I'm about to talk about is one that we talked a lot about at conference. First Timothy 4.12 says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. Amen. But we are as young people to set the example for believers in speech, in conduct, in the way we talk, in the way we act, in the way we treat others in faith and in what? Purity. As young people, we are to set the standard by how we act, talk, think, speak, and how pure our mind and heart is. And then our scripture for today, if you want to open up here in your Bibles or maybe in your notes, Matthew 5, 8, we're going to be taking some time and studying in the Beatitudes where Jesus was on the Mount, Sermon on the Mount. And, and this is not necessarily a salvation uh, doctrinal um, message or, or passage of scripture, but it's giving us disciplines and what we are to look like as a disciple, the attitude of being, be attitudes. This is how we are to act or to be in life. And Matthew 5, 8 says, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. This verse is simply telling us those who are pure, those who live lives that showcase purity in return, what? They will see God. So this morning, That was just the intro. I want to challenge you. I'm going to say some things and read some things that are not my word, but there's going to be a tension that will come into this room. I want to challenge you right now to number one, know that where there is tension, there has to be truth. If you think about a giant tent, maybe you've seen a white tent for like a revival service or like a wedding. That thing is standing strong and held up, and it covers people, and it's able to protect. But what holds it up? Stakes and a rope that are pulling on it on either side, tension, in order to hold something up. When there is truth said, 
There's always things that are holding it up, things that are said that put people in a place of tension. So today we're going to be there. We are going to embrace it together. And I want to challenge you because when we receive Jesus, the whole goal and the difference in being a believer and a non-believer is when we receive Jesus, we're not trying to take Jesus and put him into the life that we've been living, but we take him and we put him in our life and he challenges everything that we have done and we question it for the gospel. Can we do that together this morning? If you're in, say, I'm in. Oh, that's half of us. If you're in, say, I'm in. Yeah, that's better. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to learn what it means to live a pure life. God, we just pray right now that you would increase. We decrease to nothing right now, Jesus. God, fill this room. Thank you for the worship time, the praise and worship we've already had this morning. Thank you for that covering. But God, right now we claim this, this ground as holy ground. Lord, we claim in our hearts right now holy ground. And Lord, we pray right now that we, would, that we would have ears to listen and that we would embrace the tension of what your word is saying. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Now, I know what you're thinking. I have, I have, I have five principles for us. And when it comes to purity, uh, my initial reaction or thought of someone that is pure is like, I think of a weak person truthfully, like, oh, they're just so precious, and they're just so kind, and like, like, you're like, yeah, they're so pure, and then you like, look at someone else, and you're like, oh, they're nasty, but they're pure, like, uh, nasty, pure, and I, I think it's, I think it's really easy for us to, to look at purity in that way, and, and one, and one way that I, that I've seen it is I was able last year, about this time, to go to Colorado, and I was there for a wedding, and me and my roommate, we had some time to kill, so we decided to go on a train ride two hours up into the mountains, and then we got an hour to walk around. And as we were looking, we were able to see the river and just the water that was so clear and it was beautiful. And and then we walked on this bridge and the water was like kind of stagnant. And we went down to this little beach area and I stuck my foot in the water and it was the coldest thing I ever felt in my life. But I I was all of a sudden awake because it was eight in the morning, but the water was so clear and so pure. It was beautiful. And I think there is an element of purity that is, there is, there is an innocence to that. But then, uh, thinking that we we went a place that we weren't supposed to go because we just graduated college, so we can do anything. And we walked down, and there was all of a sudden the water started moving, and it was rushing, and it was. We got to this point where the water was hitting this rock; it was just crushing it and crushing it and crushing it. And I looked at my roommate, and I was like, "Bro, if I stuck my foot in there, I'd be gone. Like, see you later." He's like, "Do it. You should do it. I'm I'm annoyed with you. I'm, I'm sick of hanging out with you." Anyway, that didn't happen. But I was like, "It's crazy how something so beautiful can also be so powerful." The truth of purity is the first thing, if we want to be someone who is pure in heart, if we want to be blessed, if we want to be happy and experience true joy, the truth is being pure in heart means we have to fight boldly to keep our purity because it's both beautiful and powerful. And, and I want you to realize we have to start before we go anywhere crazy today at the beginning in Genesis. Genesis. That purity was something, there's been a war waging for your purity from the beginning of time. Genesis 3, chapters 14 and 15 says this, so the Lord said to the serpent, this is right after the fall of man. Adam and Eve ate ate the fruit, the knowledge of the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They fell, they were hiding from God. God was like, where are you? And they were hiding and and God obviously found them because he was chilling with them. And then he looks at the serpent in response and this is God's response To what happened to the fall of man. He says, so the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity or sorry, enmity. Hatred is what that means. It literally means hatred between you and the woman. And because your offspring and hers and between your offspring and hers, he, her offspring will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That offspring was Jesus. And what did the enemy take from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Purity. They were blameless. They were created in God's image. And the enemy took from them purity. And I want to just take a second and ask the question to you all today. Is that you in this room? Did something happen to you 
where you were on track, you, you, were, you, were, you, were, you were going after God. You were like, I've been saved by grace and I want to pursue being blameless and holy. I want to be more like Jesus, but something was taken from you. And I want to encourage you this morning that when we think about purity, we've got to change the narrative that it's something as just lame and little and innocent and weak. It's not. Jesus, if we look at that bottom of that verse, Jesus, he will crush the head and you and you will strike his heel. What that is saying is Jesus may have died on a cross and the enemy won for three days. But in the end, Jesus came for your purity and he crushed Satan in a fight, in a battle. The first mention of Jesus as he's fighting for purity is that as a warrior, Jesus is shown as a warrior first to destroy Satan to what? Claim back the purity of man that God instilled in us from the beginning. So what I say in that is there is a fight going on for your purity. My question to you is, are you in it? Some of you keep getting wrecked and you're like, okay, I'm just going to go do a worship service and I'm going to keep doing this. And then the rest of my week, I'm going to, no, what God is asking you right now is I already fought for you in one. Can you step into battle too? Because I'm, I'm here for you. I've already struck and crushed the head. There is a fight going on. And some of us need to get in our mind right now that we need to say the phrase over and over again, I love God too much to compromise on how I've been called to live. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When we actually look at this this verse, when when we finally enter the fight, we take that do not conform and we go, I will not conform. And I believe some of you this morning need to step in to the truth that there's a lot of conforming happening right now. You've believed the lie that you're too weak and that that it's just, I I can't fight for this. There's no way I can be blameless. And God's just asking you, just get in the fight, please. Just get in the battle, because guess what? I've already won everything. It's my battle anyway, but I I need you to take a step. I need you to be with me. There's a battle going on. What are you doing to fight that battle? We need to remind ourselves of Matthew 5, 8. I will not conform, but I will fight because I know if I fight, I will remain pure. That's God's promise. And in that, God's promise says, I will see him and I will be with him. People who are pure in heart fight boldly to stay pure. Is everybody awake this morning? It's pretty good, right? God is good. I think oftentimes when we get in the fight, though, we, we, we get in the fight finally, and then we feel like we have to do it ourselves. Or we feel like, okay, I've been saved by grace, but now that I've saved by grace, I got to figure it all out, and I got to renew myself. No. Point number two of staying pure. Someone who is pure in heart. Being pure in heart means we've been renewed. Uh, how many people here watch TV? Raise your hand. About half the congregation, sweet. How many people have seen commercials? Okay, keep your hand up if you like commercials. Zero hands. I I have a point in here. Oh, some of us, the Super Bowl ones are bad now, so they're not good. I had a point in here. I was like, if anyone's raising their hand, we'll pray for you. There's grace for you. You can come to the altar and, you know, we'll we'll move. But I I think sometimes if you look at life on on a spiritual level, not not to get super funny, but... Life can be kind of like watching TV, and we're just chilling, and, and we're doing, like, it's nothing bad, we're just hanging out with family, but all of a sudden, this commercial comes on, and you hear about this medicine that has more symptoms than it does helping, and you hear about all these things, and there's a what? There's an interruption. And I think some of you in, in this room right now, you get the concept of purity, You get the concept of, I want to pursue being blameless because that's what Jesus is and that's who he is. I get that. But there's been an interruption in my life. Maybe you become too busy. Maybe you're in this room and there's a sin that you just keep going back to. Maybe there's a lie that you keep believing that you're not actually renewed. And I'll tell you this. The world does not want you to step into a place where you're like, I'm being renewed. 
The world does not want that. Actually, it's pretty convincing that you're good where you're at. It's the weirdest thing that Satan will tell you like, hey, you're good where you're at, but also you need more. What a weird tension. And I've said, I said this at, I said this at moment conference. I'm going to say it here. Um, a caterpillar can't stay a caterpillar. And, and maybe you've had a moment with God, but all of a sudden in the process of life, you've lost your way. And I'm here to tell you something. Being renewed is a lifelong process. It is a lifelong process. And, and I just want to, and, and, and the definition of being renewed is having been resumed, reestablished, or revived. Another secondary definition is to resume after an interruption. So can I urge you this morning? Can I encourage you? Can I encourage you for a second? You got to get past the interruption. You got to take your DVR and skip through the interruption because it's stopping you from what God has planned for you. It's stopping you from changing the legacy of your family to show them what a renewed life can look like. It's time to get past the commercial. It's time to turn off the TV and open your hands and say, God, I've been renewed. Devil, you can say all you want, but I have been renewed and I'm going to respond to what the devil is pointing in my head and I'm going to stop this interruption. And I'm going to claim in my heart what my dad says, what God says about me, that in 2 Corinthians 4, 16, do, we do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed, what? Day by day. I'm going to stand firm on what God said to me, and I'm going to claim this. And so what he said in Psalms 51.10, where God created me a clean heart and a renewed steadfast spirit within me. God, give me renewed mind. God, give me a renewed mind. Heart. He says it again in Titus 3, 4 through 6, where he says, But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he what? He saved us. Not because of our righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. You've been renewed. It's time to act like it. I had a friend a long time ago. She, she talked to me, and, and, I, and I walked into a room, and I, I consider myself a little bit of a confident human being. And she goes, you walk into a room like you own it. I'm like, yeah, because I've been renewed. I don't, I don't own anything. It's all God's, but I have the confidence that I've been renewed. And I'm not going to be perfect. But by golly, I better be better than I was yesterday. And that's the goal. That's what the, the scripture is telling us. Therefore, don't lose heart. Don't give up because you've been renewed every day. You need to start acting and stepping into the confidence that you've been renewed. Because it plays right into our next part of being renewed. People who are pure in heart, being pure in heart means we've been forgiven. I'm going to take my glasses off and get serious for a second. I believe in this room, as I was praying and studying for this message, this is the one that is keeping many of us from being pure in heart. I don't know what's happened. I don't know all of your stories. I'm not going to pretend I do. I'm not going to pretend I understand. But forgiveness, I've heard it said like this, is super expensive. But it is the best thing you'll ever buy. And I believe in this room that there are people that are harboring feelings, are holding resentment to maybe a loved one, maybe a spouse, maybe a parent, that something happened. It was, it was painful and it did hurt and it really did happen and it was not okay, but you've held on to it for years, maybe decades, maybe your whole life. It has been something that has captured you. But when we're pure in heart, uh, the Bible says, God says in Colossians 3, 13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Let's be real for a second. When I read that verse, it sucks. Uh-oh. Okay, don't take that as a sign, but sound bite. I'm not spreading hypocrisy. I believe in the word of God. It's, don't need to make a clip. But that, that verse stinks. Why? Because it's convicting and challenging. Well, there's three things that we see in that verse. First off, it's not a suggestion to forgive. It's a command. 
Secondly, the command is to forgive others as the Lord has. Can I remind you that when you were saved by grace, you didn't have to earn it? Could I remind you that you didn't have to get your act together or show the person or show God that you needed to be forgiven? You just confessed and came into agreement with him. You see, the first part of forgiveness is we have got to forgive ourselves. Many of you know that part of, you know, we all have struggles. And um, one of my biggest things was sexual immorality and pornography. I was exposed to it at a young age. But guess what? It wasn't even my fault. And it wasn't until recently that I was able to share that with someone close to me. And I never came to that realization that I didn't go find it. It found me. And for years, I've held myself accountable for it. And also the person or people that exposed me. And I've never let it go. I've, I've been like, okay, God, take that away. Like, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, I'm not struggling with it anymore. But, but I've held resentment and bitterness and frankly, hatred. And I come here and I worship and I love having good times and I, love, and I believe that we can hail King Jesus and all these things. But there's this thing that when I go home at night, I'm actually reaping the harvest of the rotten seeds I've sown with my bitterness. And in that, I've actually not forgiven myself for the thing that happened to me and what I've done because of it. So the first step of forgiveness and being pure in heart is we have to understand that if Jesus died for us and we can be blameless, you've got to forgive yourself. Because if you can't forgive yourself, guess what? You're holding other people to that standard. You've got to forgive yourself. Then when you can forgive yourself, you can finally forgive others. The third thing, we are to forgive despite the state of forgiveness in the other person. You are human. You will never forget what's happened to you. Only God can cast things from the east and the rest and forget. But we can't. We're marked. It happens. And God asks us to embrace that tension and not wait for the other person to apologize, but we just forgive and let it go. Oh, I need to find closure. Make it happen. Be the closure. You don't need to find it. Just be like, God, I want to forgive. Show me how to. Be the closure. Don't wait for anyone else. Oh, well, I have church hurt and I, they hurt my feelings and uh, there's no love in that environment. And when I hang out with them, I don't like being around them, but you're there. And if you believe this book and we are to forgive as God forgave, then it shouldn't matter because you're there and you're studying this book and you forgive as the Lord has. Those who are pure in heart, they forgive. Those who want to see God and spend time with him and encounter him and be a best friend with him, they forgive. No, I don't know what you've gone through. I don't fully understand. I don't know how bad it hurt, but I do know this. If you want to see God, if you want to be real, if you want to meet him, if you want a friend that's closer than a brother, If you want to experience what true love and what true freedom is, it's time to let it go. It's time to let it go. How are we supposed to be any different than the world if we don't have unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness? Why the heck would I walk in this room? What's the difference? Even Jesus said, yeah, it's easy to love your brother and hate your enemy, but I'm asking you to love both. I'm not asking you to be best friends with that person that hurts you. I'm not asking you to all of a sudden have a return to how it was. What I'm saying is, why don't you step into the new and say, God, I want to be pure in heart. I want to see you. I want to be with you. Show me how to forgive. I want to forgive. And it all stems from the fact that the Lord forgave you and is continuing to forgive you now. I'm going to say it one last time. Those who are pure in heart, they forgive Those who want to see God, they forgive. We ought to be a church who forgives first and forgives fast and forgives 
fully. Because the truth is, the way that we saw our forgiveness displayed and the taking away with it was Jesus on the cross. Being pure in heart means we are washed clean by the blood of Jesus. Now, now I'm not trying to blow your mind with these crazy, whoa, where'd you get that from? This is basic information in the sense of our foundations. But it goes on repeating because if we forget these things, we might as well not come to church anymore. This is the basis of what we believe is all of these things. Christ died for us because there was a gap between us and God. And he wants us to be pure and created and be in the image that we were supposed to be. And so we have to understand that we've been washed by the blood. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you're not a church person, you're like, washing the blood? Dude, I'm calling the police. What? That is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. And we're so quick to be like, oh my gosh, you're washed by the blood. And like, oh, you know, I've tasted and seen that he is good. That's so weird if you don't know what we're talking about. But you see, if you study the Old Testament, you have to understand that being washed in the blood is talking about when they used to give sacrifices on an altar. And when that lamb, that perfect lamb, when he was slain and the blood ran down the altar, they were able to communicate with God and their sins were forgiven. That's the Old Testament. So then in the New Testament, what happened was Jesus was put on a cross and he bled for you eternally so we don't have to come to church and bring 80 sheep up front. Every time we want to talk to God, we have eternal access because his blood is shed for you. By his wounds, we are healed. Man, I'm preaching better than you guys are saying amen right now. By his wounds, we are healed. His blood was shed on the altar eternally. The veil was torn so that you could be cleansed and renewed. Do you see how this is working together? We got to join the fight. You got to understand you're being renewed. You got to forgive others and live in that forgiveness. Why? Because you've been washed by the blood. I've said this verse before, but it bears repeating again. First John two, verse one and two. My dear children, I write this to you. So what? You will not sin. Some of you in this room, you believe it's when I sin, not if I sin. And you're like, ah, you know, I'm just not perfect. And like, oh, I'm going to fight. Oh, God, uh, boop. you know, devil's coming in with me. Oh, no, he twisted my arm. Oh, no. Your fight's pretty weak. And you're like, oh, you know, it's going to be okay. Uh, I'm going to go back to grace. I'm going to praise. And I'm going to go party again on the weekend. I'm going to praise, but I'm going to be angry during the week. I'm going to go and praise, but all my coworkers hate me. Oh, but I'm singing Waymaker. God, you're going to make a way. You're going to change their minds. I'm always right. You're going to change them. That's sin, y'all. It's not just the big bad things. That, like, I get it. You haven't murdered anyone. Praise God. Good job. But there are other little things. If I go out during the week and I ask your boss, how your rapport is with your coworkers, what is he going to say or she going to say? Some of you are business owners and you're like, well, I love myself. It's like, okay, chill out. Chill out. <laughs> but hear me for a second. John wrote this. God spoke through John. He wrote this so you will not do that. By the power, if you've been cleansed and washed by the blood, remember what I said at the top? You're not trying to live your life how you were. You need to take God and Jesus as he was dead and as the blood washed down the altar. You need to take that point of view of life and run a filter through your life and see what you're doing wrong. It's okay. Most of the New Testament was not written to just promote God's promises. It was to correct the church. That's just a fact. And so I'm here this morning to tell you, you've been washed by the blood. So you don't have to sin. You have the power and the authority through Jesus. You're not going to say in the name of myself, but in the name of Jesus, I will not. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to wake up in the morning and preach to myself and in the mirror and cast out depression and cast out anxiety because where God is, the good God, there can't be anything else. 
You've been washed by the blood. So I write this to you so you will not sin. But if you do, if you do, can I maybe read it to you like this? Staying back on our topic. My dear children, I write this to you so you will not become impure. But if anyone does become impure, you have an advocate in Jesus. This is written in a way that shows that we're probably not going to be perfect, and that's okay. But that doesn't give us permission to not actually join the fight and just be like, devil, you got me. If we're going to go down, we're going to go down swinging. And I want to be someone that when I do pass on, hopefully a long, long time from now, that heaven rejoices and hell rejoices. Whoa, what are you saying, Marilyn? I want heaven to rejoice because I've come home, and I want hell to rejoice because I'm out of the fight. And the only way you can do that is if you live in the tension that purity is not just something for a weak person. We have to fight for purity. Do you think that it is not under attack? Uh, uh, there's a movie that's out right now that is about sex trafficking and human trafficking. It is a $150 billion industry. And guess who's the number one consumer? America. You don't think our purity is under attack. It's children. And by the Lord, they're going to have to answer, praise God, to the Lord. But I will say this. If you, if we don't understand that our purity is under attack, but our purity is powerful because we, when we are pure in heart, when we're pursuing these things, when we know that we've been washed by the blood, when we're forgiven and we act like it, when we walk in being renewed and when we join the fight, you become somebody who has purpose and you become somebody who is powerful and you wreak havoc on the enemy. And I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired of sitting here and being like, okay, I'm going to keep worshiping. We're going to sing all hail King Jesus, but I'm not joining the fight. And I want to also say this being bold is not just loud in volume. My best friends are the quietest humans on the world, but by golly, when they walk into a room, it's like, oh boy, their presence exudes boldness. So you don't have to be loud. I know I'm loud. That's how I'm bold. You don't have to be loud to be bold. But we need to be bold in the fact that we will not sacrifice the blamelessness and the great behavior that Jesus gives us power to live in. I'm not going to compromise what I've been called to do for something that's temporary and that is awful. Even though it looks very nice in the moment, I mean... The devil's not dumb. He's not going to come up to you and be like, hey, this is going to lead to divorce. Here you go. Hey, this is going to wreck your life. You're going to be addicted to this forever. Have at it. It looks appealing, but you've got to fight and you've got to remind yourself and you've got to preach every day. I've been washed by the blood. I will not compromise. I will not conform. I will be pure in heart. I will stand firm. Why? Because I want to see God. Very simple. I want to see God move. I want to see God move in my own life. I want to see God change a nation. I want to see God. And when I see God, I want God to say, when I come and meet him on judgment day, that he says, well done. I want to see God. So my question this morning is, how bad do you want to see him? Because I get it. There's been things in your life that have really wrecked you, that have knocked you down. I understand that much. I understand you might be in this room and you're like, I'm excited to get out of here. Preaching was good, but I'm excited to get out of here. I got things to do. I'm busy. Being here might have costed you something. Cost you something. But you have to identify something. And, I, I, and I'm, I am closing here, but I need, you, I need you to lock in. Here's that extra 10%. People who are pure in heart understand that they are completely washed clean as well. Being pure in heart means we have sacrifice. 
as we were getting ready for moment conference and I was getting ready for this sermon and I, I looked at Pastor Matt because I was having a really hard time writing these. Because this is a really kind of heavy message. It's, it's true, but it's heavy. And even as adults in this room, you're kind of like, Zoosh! and yeah, I went this hard at moment conference. But I was struggling and I didn't even write this sermon until about an hour before. Because I was like, I can't, I can't even, all I could do was cry. And Daniel Duth was in the back and I was watching the students worship and they're singing super loud. And all I could do was weep. Because I saw a pure generation who has been attacked and destroyed in so many ways and it's not their fault. And what did they do? They came to the altar and they sacrificed something. And I know for a while you've been looking at this vase and you're like, what in the world do we got here? It's a pretty little prop, it's super churchy. But for your visual people, I, I want to paint a picture here. So this water represents your soul and your heart and your mind and the vase is you. And when we talk about this thing of a sacrifice, sacrifice means, and I want to read this definition to make sure that I read it right, but a sacrifice is an act of getting something of value for the sake of something else that is equally or more worthy. Some of you in this room, in order for you to be pure and step into that, there's something that you need to give up. Or you need to finally step into what God has for you and say, God, I'm giving you all of me. God, I'm giving you my job. God, I'm giving you my anger. Because some of you, this is how God meant for you to be right here. This is how he designed you to be pure and blameless and holy. And then something happened. And maybe it was for one of you, for some of you, it's just something little. And, and if you look at the water, it's still, still pretty clear, right? But there's, there's just, there's something happening. Like there's just a little thing. And, and you know, like it's not that big of a deal. Most of me is still here. But then all of a sudden something else happened. And maybe it was the same thing. And maybe it was another thing. And maybe it was another thing. And before you know it, all of this stuff is coming into your life and the de enemy twir twirls you around and mixes you up. And before you know it, you're not even close to what you were created to be. And if you look at this now, it is not the same as it was before. And it has been completely overtaken by a foreign substance, by something that was never meant to be there. So friends, I gave you some categories. Maybe for you, you don't actually believe that you've been washed by the blood. Maybe for you, you're holding on to bitterness and you don't want to forgive somebody or something or the church that hurt you. Maybe for some of you, you don't believe that you can walk in renewal every day and you feel like you have to have it all figured out. Or maybe for some of you, you just are too tired to fight anymore. Maybe some of you, your purity has been compromised. You really don't know what happened. It's just spiraling. And our key verse for our weekend at moment was Romans 12, 2, which I already read. But in order for us to live out Matthew 5, 8, and be blessed and be joy-filled and filled with joy and to see God we have to understand that in Romans 12, 1, before we get the commandment to do not conform, I will not conform. Before we get that, Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. That blood that he poured out for you, you're washed, you're clean. Even if you look like this, you're completely overtaken by his blood. All he asks you to do is to give up yourself, is to give up those things that are holding you back. That's all he asks. 
Oh, it's just too painful though. It's just, it's just too painful. Yeah, it is. It is too painful for you to do by yourself. But in this moment, we're going to give an opportunity at the end of this service. But I want to show you all that God asks you to do. He sees this right now. He sees you, each and every one of you right now. For those of you that have been encaptured by this, or maybe you just have that little thing or whatever it is. He sees this. And what he's saying in that verse is, I need you to be a living sacrifice. You're breathing right now. You're not dead. You've got to be alive and give something up of value. I get it. It's going to cost you something. Maybe your reputation. It may cost you some money. It may even cost you everything on earthly value. I get it. But a sacrifice is giving something up that's going to cost you something for something greater. And that's Jesus. And all he's asking you to do is simply empty yourself. So he can fill you up. If you notice, there might be some remnants in here, but when he fills you to overflowing, it'll leave. But you gotta be empty. And when you empty yourself and you pour yourself out as a living sacrifice, the word of God says in that verse, he says, first in view of God's mercy, then he says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. When you empty yourself, if you don't do that, God has to view you because you haven't been blameless. You haven't been washed by the blood. God has to view you in judgment. But when you empty yourself, God has a view of you in mercy. But it does cost you emptying yourself. When you do that, God sees the person that you are right now. He says, hey, you don't have to do anything yet. I'm going to show you. I literally tell you in the next verse that I'll show you how to renew your But now I can view you in mercy. Now I can look at you with the lenses that I want to. Now I can view you and you're safe and you're safe. My last point is God has mercy for us. As you stand with me. Or or could I say it like this? God has enough mercy for each and every one of us. saw the demonstration you've heard the five things you might not remember them in a week that's okay I'm all right with that but I want to give an opportunity right now one of the things that I've that I've changed in thank God we can change is I believe that in these places it is the easiest place to give yourself up to God because when you leave these walls it's not going to be easy but I wanna offer an opportunity that some of you are this water in this bucket right here. I wanna offer you an opportunity to empty yourself. I'm gonna call forward anyone who may be experiencing pain, who may be just stuck and they're like, yep, that red water, Mylon, that's me. I'm not gonna ask you what you're going through, but I'm gonna invite you up front at the altar We're going to pray together, and I believe that God is going to heal and restore and redeem in this moment. Redeem literally means to turn back, to move back to its original state. It's time to empty out so God can refill. And so if that's you this morning, I want to invite you right now to come to the front. You can come right now. There's no judgment in this room. These are brothers and sisters. This is your family. As Michael Smoot said this morning, come together, come in close, come in close, come in close. As you come to the front, maybe push your arms out and up and open palms in a posture of receiving, yes. Wow. all these people. Praise God. I want to invite you, if you're in the crowd right now, 
you're still feeling that, that this message is speaking to you, that God has spoke to you, I want to still invite you to come. But if you're in the crowd right now, would you just lean your hands forward at the people up here as we pray together? Father, thank you for the obedience in this room. Thank you for this word that you've given us, God. God, I pray for anyone up here that is dealing with trauma, that is having a hard time forgiving, that doesn't really believe that they're worthy of being washed by your blood, that doesn't believe that they're worthy of walking in the renewed process each and every day. God, I pray for the person right now who's too tired to fight, who's exhausted, God. I pray that you, that you would give them energy and that they would start saying in Jesus' name over their whole life and they would join the fight and fightly or and boldly fight to stay pure, God. God, I pray for the person right now who's offering a sacrifice, God. You see the empty vase. You see the empty person right now. You see that they've come to the front to empty themselves. God, would you fill them with your living water, God? Your word says that, that your water is a water that when we drink it, we'll never thirst again. So God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would fill every single person that is up front, fill every single person that's in this room with your living water, your pure and your beautiful living water. God, we pray and we command our souls today to remind ourselves that we are blessed when we are here in heart and because God you've transformed us in Jesus name in this moment because of what you've done Lord that we will see you so God right now as we take just a moment to pause I pray that you would show your face God to each and every person in this room in Jesus name that you would show your face God that you would not hold back that you would shine your light God that there can be no darkness where your light is shining. God, we pray as a congregation, as a family today, we step in and as, a, as a way of intercession for our brothers and sisters, God, that you are creating a way, that you are making a way. God, we believe that your word, when your word says what the enemy meant for evil, you are gonna make for good. We believe that you are turning everything for the good of those to believe. God, we speak it in Jesus' name. God, we pray against any lie that the enemy would be putting in our people's heads God we pray against anything that would be holding them back from pursuing or longing to be pure in heart and God we know right now I, I speak power I empower I speak encouragement into the people up front that as they are filled with your pure presence as they are filled with your pure spirit that they would be known that they can have confidence and power in Jesus name we pray power in Jesus name we pray confidence in Jesus name in this room we pray boldness in Jesus name and we pray resilience in the fight God we pray the full armor of God on each and every person in this room and God the people up front Lord would you give them an anointing to do something in their workplace God would you remind them that they have been praying for a miracle but you are asking them to step into the miracle why because you use your broken people to do miracles God by the authority of Jesus in Jesus name we give these things to you we believe you're powerful enough we believe you're big enough God and we believe you are doing them and we commission to them them to you in Jesus name I want to invite you as we close in prayer here to grab the hand of your neighbor even if it's sweaty it's okay We do this as a sign of unity. And in the family, and in the church, and in friendships and relationships all across the country, the enemy is against unity. And so what we do this, we do this right now as a sign because we've just lifted up something and when we finally are filled spiritually, we're actually emotionally vulnerable. And the enemy tends to come in after we have a spiritual high. And so what we're going to do right now is we're going to stand in unity and pray together that we would be a strong front and that we would remind ourselves who our God is. So Father, right now we pray as we hold hands as a sign of unity. God, we remind ourselves that you are our strong tower, that you are our fortress, God, that you are our refuge and strength. Like it says in your word in Isaiah, that you hold us up. You hold us up with your righteous right hand. So God, I pray for every single person in this room, God, that has been filled by you, that has been changed by you, God, that you would 
Give us the power to stand together, that you would give us the power to see past each other's faults and know that we are family, that you would give us the power to stand together against any attacks of the enemy. God, I pray for a church and a people right now that are, that are working and striving towards you and that the enemy hates and that when we end the fight and when we return to your glory and see you in heaven, that all of hell rejoices because we're out of that fight. I pray for that boldness. I pray for that power right now and I pray for the unity. I think of a chain link right now, God, that can't be broken. The strongest thing. You say that three cords braided together are strong. God, we want to be three braided cords together. God, give us unity as we are unified by your presence and by your holy name. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Would you please give God some praise in this place? God is good. Amen. The last thing I want to say, and I I do have to slip out and get to Hudson because I would like to preach this message live, but I want to say that Pursuing purity, when we want to pursue power, it's a present thing. We got to do this each and every day. But God will reward and honor your obedience, and you're not alone. That's the biggest thing we have to remember is we serve a God who is in relationship with us each and every day. None of us are alone, and his mercy is enough for all of us. So let's go out and make a difference this week and do something crazy for the Lord. Amen? Amen. Can we give God one more hand clap of praise? Hey, thank you for being at C3 Church this morning. Please greet each other, fellowship at the end. Uh, If you want to be a part of a small group, find Michael Smoot and Melissa Smoot. We love you all. Let's go make a difference.